Hi everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in to our fourth interview for with the Red Stone. Uh, we have with us today Professor Abelard, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at NUS. So Professor Abelard's research lies in ethics, rationality and epistemology, but he also offers classes in NUS in early Greek philosophy as well as in politics, philosophy and economics. So hi Professor. Um, hey everybody. Yes. So I guess we will start with some warm up questions to get to know you better. So one question that one of your students really wanted to know is um, why you start every lesson with a music video? Also, I, I, I got that from, uh, from one of the professors that I uh, TA'd for in um, grad school. Although he was a lot, he was a lot meaner about it than I am. So he may he was he really wanted to come in to like his favorite songs playing, and so what he would do it he would make us the, the other TAs and I sort of set up a song beforehand, and he had he was very specific about exactly what what time he wanted to come in. So he wanted us to like start it at, you know precisely this time so that right when he walks in there'd be like the part of the song that he <laughs> that he really likes, so you could have like a theme song when he entered. Um, I thought that was. Uh, I mean, I thought it was silly, but also kind of funny. Um, and I also like, I just, I like music. I like, uh, I like movies. I like to share things that I like with other people. Um, and one nice thing about being a professor is you have all these students who are forced to listen to whatever you, you give them. Uh, and so I can, like, I have a captive audience where I can just enforce my tastes on them. Uh, and I, I enjoy that. So that's, that's why I do it. See, does it have any pedagogical purpose or? No, ab absolutely no pedagogical purpose, except that the songs that I choose are, uh, are good songs. And so uh, people's uh, people, mu musical tastes, if they're paying attention, will be improved by listening to my music. Um, that's, that's the only pedagogical purpose. I, also, I try to pick songs that are related in some way to like the material of the class. And sometimes it's more subtle than others, um, but no, I, mean, I don't expect people to get that much out of it. Uh, I think I probably get more out of it than the students, but um, hopefully some people, some people have said that they like the music, so um, I'm gonna keep doing it. What's a language that you'd like to pick up? A language that I'd like to pick up? Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I think it would be, I think it's unlikely that it'll ever happen. I think it'd be interesting to, to know Mandarin, especially since I'm here in, in Singapore in this part of the world. Um, I think it'd be kind of interesting to know ancient Greek since I don't really read a lot of uh, history of philosophy, but, um, but I love Plato. And I think it'd be kind of um, nice to be able to read Plato in the original. Uh, I don't know if that's enough motivation to get me to learn an entire language, but I think those are probably the ones that stand out. Now, then, what's the funniest thing that you've done in your classes or during final exams? The funniest thing that I've done? Ooh, uh, what did I do? I mean, during during final exams, I don't do uh, I don't do that much. Sometimes I read. So there's like these final exams are pretty boring for a professor. Um, like you get these instructions and you have to read the instructions, and then you have to like wander around the. Um, the lecture hall, that's pretty, that's pretty dull. Um, so sometimes I read the instructions in like a, I don't know, a weird accent. Like I'll do like, try to do like an American Southern accent or like a British accent. I used to, I used to like doing accents when I was, uh, when I was younger. Uh, I'm not very good at it, but, but uh, I sometimes have fun um, that way. I, I had to miss a final exam once as well because, uh, because I had a video game tournament that I wanted to uh, attend. And so I, uh, I got I got a, a colleague to fill in for me, um, and he he spilled the beans to the students about why I wasn't there. Um, I heard, wait, what video game is that? Uh, that was probably I mean I, I play a lot of video games, um, but most recently I I've, I've been playing a lot of Super Smash Brothers. So um, there there was a point at which I was the the best Super Smash Brothers player at NUS. Um, I think there are a couple of better players now, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I played. I played a lot of that game. I played a lot of the MOBA games. I used to play StarCraft a lot um, when I was in grad school. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very competitive. I, I like to I like to play games. I like to play card games and board games. 
Um, and yeah, I'm happy to play with students. So sometimes I set up uh, games in my office and if any student wants to come by and uh, play something with me, I'm, I'm usually down. I had a student once just come in with like Pokemon cards <laughs> and ask me if I wanted to play. And uh, yeah, I'm totally down for that. You once uh, came to university scholars program to uh, engage in a Super Smash Brothers competition. Yeah, yeah, I brought, I had like a little, little uh, set that I, I carry around with me sometimes. And since I was gonna hang out with the students, I thought I might as well bring it and uh, play a couple games with with some of the students. I think they're 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 very serious students. So I don't think a lot of them were um, experienced gamers. <laughs> I think I have I have more free time than a lot of the students do. Oh, what's a day in your life like as a philosopher? Uh, well, so uh, so I guess an ideal day would be I like I would get up. I would I don't know. Uh, eat breakfast and go to the office, maybe work a little bit. I find it hard to work from home. So, so that's, that's nice. And then, I don't know, I, uh, I, I try not to work that long. I think after, after I work, you know, a few hours, my, my mind is often pretty, pretty shot, especially if I'm, if I'm thinking really hard about something. So then I'll, I don't know, do something more relaxing. I'll watch, I'll watch a movie. I love to watch movies and TV shows. Uh, I'll go out, I'll play games. Um, I don't know, that's not really as a philosopher. That's just what, what my life looks like. I think people should should always spend at least some time doing things besides work. So I think um, I, I encourage my students to listen to music and watch movies uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. There's just so much beautiful, beautiful art out there. That'd be a shame to miss it because you're, you're working too hard. And why, why do you do philosophy and how did you get into philosophy? Well, so, so honestly, I didn't, I never thought about it that, that hard about my choices. I'm not like a very forward thinking person. I just sort of at every point in my life, I was doing whatever I thought was the most interesting at that, at that time. And so when I was an undergrad, I was doing mathematics, which I liked, um, and philosophy. I, I tried a bunch of things. I did, I took film classes, I took uh, writing classes, I took uh, math, I took philosophy, and I liked all of it, but I think I liked philosophy the most. Um, one of the reasons that I liked it is I, I really hated to lose arguments. <laughs> um, I hated to uh, feel like I didn't have reasons for the things that I thought. So like I had, I had some, some beliefs about like God and so on. And I felt like uncomfortable if people would sort of press me on, uh, on those beliefs and I didn't, didn't have great, great responses to them. Um, that was like really, like it really bugged me. And so it's like this itch that you sort of have to scratch, I think, for a lot of people. And, uh, and philosophy was like the, the discipline that, that handles that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, it sort of helps you, helps you think clearly about, about reasoning and about those kinds of questions. And so I think that's what, um, what attracted me to it. Uh, and yeah, it makes you really good at winning arguments too, uh, which doesn't hurt. Respect to your competitive nature. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a relationship there. Would you encourage students uh, to take philosophy? I think, I think it's use. I mean, I would encourage students to take like at least a little bit of philosophy. Um, I don't think I would encourage most students to like go into philosophy um, like super seriously, maybe not to be majors, maybe not to be you know, grad students in philosophy. But I think a little bit of philosophy can be, can be nice. Um, Especially, I think almost every student has some things that they believe very strongly that are that's sort of philosophy relevant. Um, they have beliefs about religion. They have beliefs about ethics. Um, I think it's you know those those beliefs are going to be important to them for their entire lives. It would be kind of nice if they at some point like looked at well what are the what are the smartest people who are like dedicating their lives to working on um, on on that exact topic? What do they think? Um, I think. It's, it's sort of a disservice to yourself if you don't even investigate that. So I think, yeah, everybody should take uh, one or two philosophy classes, but maybe not, not much more than that. So it seems that the line between like life and the practice of philosophy is really not at all distinct for me. I don't know, I mean, there's a, so philosophy is all about sort of thinking clearly about things and it's, it's relevant whenever you're arguing with people about anything. 
Um, and that, that happens a lot, but there's also more to life than that. So I'm not sure that philosophy is super relevant to, you know, <laughs> to my, my, uh, my, my playing video games. I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's very relevant. I'm not sure that you need to do a lot of philosophy in order to listen to music or um, in order to, you know, appreciate a great book. Um, maybe philosophy helps sometimes with that sort of thing, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that you don't need philosophy for. And so uh, for everybody who's, who's never taken a philosophy class, your life is not, uh, <laughs> is not thereby uh, worthless, despite what, uh, what Plato might, might say with his, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. It's, it's still worth living. It's just not quite as worth living. And do you think philosophy can incite change in the way people act, for example, with regards to the way they treat animals? So I mean, clearly it can. Um, so there are a lot of people who, who have changed their behavior because of, of philosophy. And there's like an entire movement uh, recently, relatively recently, the effective altruism movement, which is heavily motivated by philosophy. And the things they focus on, the things they care about are motivated by philosophy. And so clearly it is possible. Um, I, ho I hope that, <laughs> that some people are like, that I have, I have taught or that I will teach at some point will be um, will change their behavior because of that. Um, I don't think most people do. I think um, I think most people are like pretty pretty unresponsive <laughs> to arguments. Um, uh, they there's certain things that they are are going to do no matter what you no matter what you teach them, no matter what you try to convince them of. Even if you succeed in convincing of them, they'll still do the they'll still do the still do what they were going to do. <clears throat> and I think um, that's that's an unfortunate fact about about humans, um, but, but yeah, um, there are gonna be a lot of people who, who, uh, who ignore everything that they hear in a philosophy classroom um, about eating meat or about other sorts of moral things um, because yeah, people, people don't really care about doing, doing what's right. Um, in your paper on um, the diner's defense, uh, you end off with a note of caution that you presented uh, an argument that you think is correct, but that you also think is dangerous. So on one hand, I guess there is that danger of, um, I guess, rational arguments, but also uh, its inability, I guess, to effect much change on people with overwhelming inertia. So just, just we were just wondering about your thoughts on treading or, uh, between these two sad poles. Yeah, the sad poles of like uh, giving an argument that convinces people and makes them do something bad versus having them not con convinced at all or not change the behavior no matter what you say. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's tough. I think I think maybe I was giving myself too much credit with uh, <laughs> with that bit at the end of the paper. Um, I think probably nobody uh, my argument will not <laughs> will will not change almost anybody's behavior. Um, so I think that that danger is probably over overstated, uh, although it's uh, it's nice to pat myself on the back and pretend like I have that much influence over people. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's unfortunate that a lot of people can misread an argument or can use anything that you teach them to serve the wrong ends, and that happens in in philosophy quite a bit. People like people want to look for evidence and arguments that support what they already think. And so, um, like with my paper, I, I wasn't trying to convince people not to care about uh, care about animal suffering and about factory farming, which is awful, even if everything I say in that paper is correct. But um, uh, but somebody might look at it and say, ah, here's a here's an argument that is going to defend eating meat. So I'm just going to take this. I'm going to use it to defend eating meat. I'm going to say, hey, here's a philosopher who says uh, eating meat is fine, and so we don't have to worry about this. Uh, I wouldn't want that to be the lesson anybody takes, but there's nothing you can you can do to stop people. Um, so you just you just do the work and hope that <laughs> hope that people are well motivated when they read your stuff. Do you wish that more people were motivated or uh, would change their conduct just on the basis of a rational argument? Yeah, I mean, I do. <laughs> I do think that it would be better if people were more responsive to. Um, reasons and reasoning. Um, I, I do think there's a way of like 
going overboard. So you don't, I think <laughs> one thing that especially as sort of um, some people, especially when they're when they're younger and like really into philosophy, they kind of like every time they hear an argument, they, they find it's convincing. They're like, oh, I, I can't find anything wrong with this argument. They think, oh, I, this pressure, I have to change my behavior. And I think it's not, it's not quite that simple. So the fact that you can't find anything wrong with an argument doesn't mean that the argument is um, is good, and it doesn't even mean that, that you should think the argument is good. Um, maybe you have some like prior intuitions. Maybe you have some prior uh, beliefs, and discovering that an argument that like there's an argument against your position and not knowing how to respond to it that doesn't necessarily force you to give those 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 beliefs up um, but i think it should at least make you a little bit uncomfortable and make you like look into what what the reasons might be and sort of reevaluate um, those beliefs or at least lower lower your confidence um, which is i think where most people probably should end up after um, after really thinking about a lot of issues is with pr pretty pretty low confidence and very few like full beliefs about what's what's right and wrong um, and various other philosophical things. And I'm just curious about how you formulate your projects um, is, uh, and have there been arguments that you find you cannot um, I guess undermine, based on logic, but you thoroughly disagree with? I think, well, I think there's a lot of arguments like that. So uh, part, of the, part of this is just the, the way I think of philosophy is there, there, there are very few like knockdown arguments in philosophy that anybody has to accept that are like four interesting positions. Um, and so what you really find is there's like clusters of views out there in like logical space that sort of make sense together. Um, and so, um, you can't, if somebody, if somebody is like occupying that cluster, they like, you know, um, they hold all the beliefs that make sense given, you know, uh, given the relations between those ideas. Um, there's, there's not really an argument you can use to, um, to undermine them probably. Um, and I think there are a lot of sort of stable clusters out there. Um, so there, there are a lot of positions where I feel like at, at a certain point, if somebody's committed to those positions um, and they're willing to give up a lot of things that maybe most people think or that I think, then there's nothing I'm going to be able to say to undermine them or there's no, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's no way I can, I can sort of uh, respond to their argument in a way that they'll find convincing. Um, but, but hopefully I'll be able to respond to their argument in a way that I'll find convincing given my other commitments. Um, and I think a lot of philosophy is, is like that sort of finding, finding the sort of clusters of positions and views that, that make a lot of sense together and that you can hold in a, in a coherent way. Um, I don't know if that completely answers your question. Um, but there, there, yeah, there are quite a few, I think, arguments that I have, I have not much to say against if somebody were really to press them. What is maybe the, uh, the argument that troubles you most? <laughs> in the sense that you can't agree with them on an instinctual level, but they seem to hold water? Um, let me think. I mean, there, <laughs> there's some arguments that, that, that I have that I don't want to accept, um, but, I, but I, I sort of feel committed to um, almost. So like rec recently, um, I wrote a paper, and a, one implication of that paper, which I didn't notice at first, but somebody pointed out to me, was that if everything I said was right, then probably um, everything we do is, is morally okay. Um, and roughly the reason for that is um, everything we do changes who's going to exist in the future because of like butterfly effect things. Like you, you know, you, 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 you make a puff, puff of wind, a like a hundred years later, there's all these like downstream effects. It'll change all kinds of things about the world. It'll change the identity of everybody who exists in the future. Um, and uh, according to my view, um, sort of if, if people are grati are, have gratitude for uh, you bringing them into existence, then that can kind of, uh, you, can, you can use that to sort of respond to objections to your actions. If some people have gratitude for your actions, and so because uh, your actions have so much impact on who exists in the future, basically no matter what you do, there are gonna be a whole bunch of people 
were going to be grateful that you did that because <laughs> they wouldn't exist if you hadn't done if you hadn't done what you did. And so you're going to be able to use their uh, uh, use their gratitude to kind of counter any objections people have to your behavior. Um, at least that's what my view <laughs> in the paper would have implied. And so um, that's that's that seems bad <laughs> in a certain way to say everything we do is permissible. Um, but I kind of I kind of felt almost committed to it. Like I had to say it given uh, uh, given everything else I thought. Do you think you'll be writing a counter argument to that anytime soon? <laughs> that's 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 how it tends to go. So yeah, maybe I'll I'll write the paper where I argue that, and then I'll write another paper where I argue against it, and then I'll get uh, two papers for the price of one. That's oh. a bargain in philosophy. Then how would you describe, uh, I guess, your general process uh, in project formulation for philosophy? <laughs> I'm not sure. I have like a very formal process. I. I usually like think about there's like usually something that uh, that I'm I'm thinking about when I when I have an idea so I, I have ideas in all kinds of places I have I, one thing that's nice about philosophy is that you can just like as a philosopher you go to talks and you listen to people give arguments even about things that you've never thought about and you can usually understand what they're what they're getting at if the if the talk is good at least and so a lot of my ideas are just me going to these you know talks that just happen to be um, coming up periodically or you know at a conference um, and then I have some idea during the talk and then what I'll do is I'll scribble it down down the idea in like a, a google doc just like two sentences of like what about if you know blah 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 and then whenever I'm feeling low on like inspiration I'll go back to that document and I'll try to reconstruct what idea I was having at the time and then and then I'll I'll think about whether there's an argument there and I think I think I'm kind of lazy about reading philosophy. So I think I, I read philosophy less than a lot of my colleagues do. I think some people, they read a lot of philosophy before they get started on, a, um, on an idea. And I think I'm a little bit the opposite. I like, I have some idea and then I'll, I'll like start writing the paper and like maybe finish writing the paper before I even read uh, what anybody else has written on it. And then I'll go into the literature and I'll say, okay, what, <laughs> what have other people said? And then just like cross my fingers that nobody has said exactly what I wanted to say. Um, which can be can definitely backfire, um, but so far it served me okay. Is that a process you recommend to your students? That's a good question. Uh, I think, so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do think actually for, for undergraduate students, I don't recommend that they like read a ton of philosophy before they, they start thinking through their ideas. I think, I think almost, I think it's a worse strategy for me than it is for students. I think students should practice like the thinking on your own part of philosophy more than like the researching part, the sort of, because I mean, you're, you're as, a, as an undergraduate, like the paper you're gonna come up with is not gonna, it's not like, I hate to break it to you. It's not gonna, you know, blow up the field, the field of philosophy, all right? So you're not, you're not really aiming to like say something you know, tremendous and original, and it's going to destroy everything that came before it. Um, you're trying to practice thinking for yourself and writing for yourself, and um, and coming up with arguments that are convincing. And so, if you do that, and then it ends up that okay, maybe somebody's had a similar idea, or maybe somebody's had an objection to that your idea that you didn't you didn't notice at first because you didn't do the reading. I think that's all that's all fine. I think you still you still got value out of it. Um, and I also think that. Undergraduates sometimes, um, especially those that aren't used to philosophy, they sort of misunderstand what a philosophy research paper is like, and so they just like read, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of people writing about something, and then uh, and then they don't know what to do, and so they like try to like recombine things that people have said or repeat it, and I think that's just not not what philosophy is about. So I think, yeah, I, I recommend I recommend my method for um, for undergraduates, but maybe not for for graduate students or for, for philosophers who all have their own methods, so they don't need me to tell them what to do. Like, um, what do you have to say about the general view that you have to kind of find that gap in the literature? And so I guess the view that you have to read a whole ton uh, at a graduate level and at a professional level before you embark on something. I mean, I don't think so. I think 
I mean, it's true that you have to, like, if you want to, I think it, it's, it's sort of necessary that if you want to sort of publish something and be successful, you have to, you have to, you have to sort of plug some sort of gap um, in the existing literature. So we don't want, we don't want, it would be, it would be bad for to have people like just repeating themselves over and over and over again for all of eternity. Um, but I think you don't need to read a ton in order to do that. Partly that's because um, if you don't read very much, then in a way it's, it's more likely that what you write will be sort of unoccupied because like the more you read, the more you become kind of uh, sort of, you, you start to think of things in the same way that the people you're reading are thinking of them. So um, if you don't read them at all, then you might kind of approach it from a slightly different angle. And so it's actually in a way more likely that your first idea will, will be at least a little bit outside of, of what people are saying. That's, that's part of why I like um, sort of my, my method. Um, but uh, also there's lots of, uh, there's lots of literature, like new literature coming out all the time, like new ideas, new topics that people are interested in. And so uh, they're kind of new, new gaps that are being opened up all the time. So, you know, people, people weren't talking about certain like areas, like uh, socially relevant kinds of philosophy, like philosophy of, I don't know, transgenderism or whatever. They weren't really writing about that, um, you know, uh, uh, so and so many years ago. And so if the literature on it is more recent, then there's, there's always gonna be something for you to say and you don't need to, you know, read thousands of pages because there just isn't thousands of pages that's worth reading on, on those newer topics. Um, and so that's actually one, I think, successful strategy uh, for younger people is just to like, okay, what are, what, is, what are the new topics where there isn't much that people have written on? Uh, read what, what there is, which might be only, you know, five or six papers, and then you know everything that ever, anyone's ever written on it. And uh, whatever gaps are there, you can, you can be ready to fill. So that's, that's how some of my papers have, have kind of come about. Like I have a paper on moral uncertainty, um, and there are there just weren't, or maybe still aren't that many papers written on that topic. And so I didn't have to read very much, which is good for me because I don't like to read. Um, That's a really, I guess, surprising revelation from a professional <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, what do you have to say to the, I guess, negative stereotype of the lone armchair philosopher seated in an ivory tower? Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of like that, that image. That's sort of how, uh, in, in a way, I, 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 I think it's nice from the internal perspective. I sort of understand why other people who are outside of philosophy would think, oh, that's, um, uh, that's like so, uh, I don't know, superior or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's great. <laughs> from the inside, it's great. Um, but it, 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 it reminds me when I was in, in grad school, my advisor, uh, after we had this like area exam where we like sort of studied our, our area and then we had to do this exam and then our like professors would quiz sort of test us, you know, verbally and so on. Uh, and then uh, determine whether we passed. And I remember my advisor after, after that exam, they, they took me and they, they showed me this, this painting by, uh, by Rembrandt called, uh, I think it's called the, the philosopher in meditation. And the painting has this, it's got this like uh, sort of staircase. Uh, and then on one side, there's this, um, there's this old guy who's sort of sitting by the window and he's kind of very relaxed and all the light from the window is coming in. And it feels like he's sort of taking on all this light from outside. And then on the other side of the staircase, there's this guy who's sort of like in the dark and he's like, there's like a fire for some, for some reason. And he's like poking at the fire by himself, like huddled in the corner. Um, and my advisor said, Abelard, you're, you're too much like that guy poking the fire in the corner. <laughs> you should be more like that guy who's, who's by the window and like taking light in from outside. Um, and so I think that's, that, that's a lesson that's, <laughs> that's stuck to me a little bit. I think there's, um, there's at least one trap in philosophy people fall into, which is, which is sort of not, not being responsive to the insights people have from, from elsewhere outside of philosophy, but also from other philosophers. Um, uh, and that's something I've been guilty of before, um, but hopefully, hopefully it's changed a little bit since then. 
how how much of philosophy do you think is a team sport compared to like a one person project? Interesting. So, I mean, the way I work is very. There's, there's. First of all, there are, there are some people who do a lot of like co-writing in philosophy. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of them. I've never like really co-written a paper. Um, I think it's just not a norm in philosophy for reasons that are not 100% clear. Um, it seems like it would make sense for people to co-write a little bit more. Um, so in, in that sense, and, and you can be successful either way. There are people who are successful co-writing a lot of papers, the people who are successful writing by themselves. I sort of like, I, I like, you know, I'm the guy huddled in the corner poking, <laughs> poking the fire. So I like, I like writing myself. I don't want people to like interrupt me with their, you know, stupid ideas, <laughs> um, trying, to, trying to change what I want to say. Um, so, uh, so you can definitely you can definitely play it as an individual sport, um, but you're always going to be responding to other people, um, and so in in some way, um, there's there's always other people involved indirectly, even when the work itself is like very isolated. Um, so I don't I don't know what that means about it, you know the, whether it's an individual sport or a team sport. Um, there's, there's a sense in which we're all in it together. We're all kind of talking to each other, hopefully to get closer to the truth. I'm not sure how, how, how seriously individual philosophers take that as a motivation. Uh, maybe that's like a, just a sort of ideal. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of like the sort of individual aspect of doing philosophy. That's partly why I think I'm more attracted to philosophy than some other things where you have to work a lot with other people. That's why that's why I didn't go into film because to you know if you want to make a movie you have to work a lot with other people, uh, and I can't stand other people so um, so philosophy was much better for me. But can but you can stand your students you you like your students. <laughs> I do actually so I was I was maybe being a bit <laughs> a bit unfair there. Uh, I like people I just don't like to work with them. <laughs> uh, it's like, I mean, you, you, you probably like all your classmates, but, you know, group projects, <laughs> you know, you get, you get together, you do some group projects, and you, you end up uh, hating them sometimes, being miserable, you know, trying to coordinate uh, all that stuff. I've, I've never been very good at that. Uh, I'm not, that's why I'm not good at, at team, team games and video games as well. I'm really bad at, at MOBAs because I can't work with a, <laughs> with a team. That's why I play Super Smash Bros. because I just play by myself. Um, uh, and yeah, that's true in philosophy as well. But my students, I, I like. I, I, I like them. Um, I just wouldn't want to write a paper with them. No offense. Do you enjoy teaching? Yeah, actually, I, I've, I've been surprised how much I enjoy teaching. Um, I like relative to what I expected when I went into philosophy. And I think there, there are some philosophers who, like, they, they just go in entirely for the research. And so for them, teaching is kind of a... Um, it's kind of a chore, a chore. Uh, but uh, I, I found it's kind of, I, I found that at least I get a little bit miserable when I don't have anybody to teach. So uh, like this, la this last year I was, I was off uh, in the US uh, doing you know, a research fellowship thing. I didn't have anybody to teach and it was kind of, it kind of sucked. I was like online, like arguing with people online just because like I needed somebody to like throw my ideas at who would listen to me, um, and uh, students are are like that. So uh, it's 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 great it's great to have them. Um, it's also like philosophy is a discipline where it's easy to feel like you're not making much of an impact. Like you're writing something, and like who's going to read it? Like ten people who are working on the same problem maybe are going to read your paper. Uh, that doesn't feel like you're like you're you're doing much. Um, but when you're when you're teaching, like you've got all those students and they're listening to what you say, uh, and hopefully some of them are getting something out of it. Um, even just doing something like you know, making your students laugh or uh, you know having a funny slide or um, having like a student write a good paper or something like that's I think very very motivating when a lot of philosophy can be depressing. Um, just like the experience of writing papers, trying to get them published, and so on. Was, so was the, is teaching something that you discovered that you liked, or was it an aspect of being of going to academia? I guess that you looked forward to. I think I was a bit surprised at how much I would enjoy it. I mean, I 
I did a little bit of teaching in grad school and I enjoyed that. And I, I did some tutoring and like math and logic even as an undergrad. Um, and I enjoyed that too. But I think, um, I, I think I, I, I underestimated how like important the teaching part of philosophy would be to sort of my, my self image as a philosopher. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's something I discovered along the way. Um, and I'm still not very good at it. So, so, you know, uh, warning to anybody who wants, wants to be my student. I'm not a very good teacher. I think I'm working on it, but, um, uh, it's something that's, that's, that's more important to me than I thought it would be. Maybe I, I suspect you are shortchanging yourself there, but uh, oh, just, just a, I guess a sidetrack. Uh, you were talking about how you didn't want to go into film because you would have to work with people. So just um, kind of curious about how important film was. Uh, was it, were you like at, a, at any point in your life at a crossroads between film and philosophy or something else? Um, I mean, in... I guess there, there wasn't like a like a moment where it was like you must choose between these two things. Um, I've I've always been interested in film, and I I, st I I watched film even after I went into philosophy, full time. Um, I think it's just like I I took a bunch of film classes. I was considering you know uh, being being a filmmaker, being a writer, uh, various other things. And part of it is I I just found philosophy a little bit more interesting. Um, partly, I don't know, I, some of the classes in my particular university were, were a little bit bad, and so it just wasn't as fun for me. Um, and partly, yeah, I just sort of decided that uh, I didn't want, like, I, I, I would have loved to create something, you know, beautiful, like a, a great movie, but uh, I was worried that people were going to, like, destroy my vision. And I was, <laughs> I, I had this, like, you know, very um, adolescent of idea of myself as, like, this great artist and nobody could could possibly help me. They could only ruin my, my brilliant ideas. Um, and I didn't want that. So I went into philosophy instead. I can ruin my own brilliant ideas. Oh yeah. Yeah, you talk about putting forward an argument and then maybe countering your argument. That's a great thing, a two for one view. Do you, do you see philosophy as something, I, guess, I, uh, I, I don't know, like, an art form is it like when you put together a great argument you think oh that's that is beautiful <laughs> the way you do I, we do for film. I, yeah. I think I think it is like that sometimes I think there's a lot of beauty to you know there's definitely times where I read an argument and I even if I think the argument is like not <laughs> not correct I think well that's like that's such a it's such a clever argument such a beautiful argument such a brilliant idea there's some mathematical arguments that are like that too like proofs Right. So if you've ever if you've ever seen the proof for why there are different sizes of infinity, um, like the diagonal, there's this di famous diagonal argument. Um, and it's just it's just beautiful as like a as like an argument. Um, uh, and so I think there's there's a lot of that. Um, I'm not sure if I view philosophy as as more of an art form. To some extent, I view it as kind of like a game. Um, so there's there's like a lot of rules. Uh, <laughs> In philosophy, and then um, yeah, you sort of you go out there and you 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 play the you play the game as best you can, and some people are better at it than others, and you can practice and and get better at it. I think there's there's sort of, it's sort of like a puzzle, there's a puzzle aspect to it. You know, there's a there's a problem you have to solve. Um, there's certain things that count as like making progress on on that um, on that puzzle, and then there's a sort of um, there's a fun to it. Um, I think for for those of us who uh, uh, who, who really get into it. I think that, that's sort of a split between philosophers that I sometimes notice is there's some philosophers who are like, who really see it as a game. And then there's some people who are like, I don't know, true, more like true believers, I would say, where they think, no, it's like, I, I went into philosophy because, you know, I, I thought this was the correct view. I thought it was important for other people to um, understand that this was true. And so I have to I have to get to the truth and I have to convince other people of the truth because that's, it's, you know, it's important and real and um, it brings human knowledge forward. Um, and there are some people who are like, no, I went to philosophy because it was this fun game that everybody's playing with each other, right? They give arguments and counter arguments and there's like a whole, uh, this, you know, back and forth to it. Uh, the professor that I TA'd for who was 
uh, who, who, who I mentioned, uh, he, he, who, who made me uh, put up the songs every, uh, every class, he would always describe philosophy as like jujitsu. Like there's a sort of a martial arts element to it. You know, somebody makes a move and then you got to make a, the right counter move, right? Um, and I think some people just enjoy the, the sort of the game of, of arguing with people that way, um, whether or not it gets them any closer to the truth. Um, I think I have a little bit of, of both, both sides. Um, I have a little bit of uh, a true believer and I have a little bit of, of sort of the, the puzzle solver uh, mentality. Um, I was so curious about um, how your research moves from epistemology to more ethics today. Do you have an account for why that shift happened? Uh, so in a, in a way, I think, so there are a couple of things. One is, I, I think I was interested in ethics before I was interested in epistemology. And then just sort of random factors, like who you happen to be paired up with, like during grad school as an advisor, um, like their interests affect your interests during grad school. And so I sort of drifted towards epistemology in grad school. Um, and then kind of once, once those influences aren't there anymore, I sort of drifted a little bit back into ethics. So in, in a way it was more like going home intellectually than like finding something new. Um, uh, like I actually did my, my area exam wasn't in epistemology, it was in metaethics um, way back when. Um, but also when I came here, I was teaching all ethics classes um, because they needed somebody to teach ethics. And so I was teaching ethics classes, which, which means I was thinking a lot about ethics. And so um, I think that also influenced me. That's another way in which teaching, I think, surprised me a little bit um, is that it has more effect on what I think about than uh, I would have thought. Um, and in fact, one of my papers uh, actually came out of uh, an idea I had when I was teaching a class on population ethics. I was, uh, I had some idea, I ended up later writing into a paper. Um, was, it so yeah. paper, was it the paper with uh, mathematical proofs and diagrams? No, it, was, it wasn't that one. Uh, it was, although, although that one was probably related and that was also related in, in, in a way, but maybe indirectly, but more directly the paper that I wrote in, in response to a class that I was teaching was, um, it's, it's this paper called Partiality, Identity, and Procreation, I think. It's about, it's about sort of having, having kids and whether you should care about your future children. Um, I sort of argue you shouldn't care about your future children. Uh, and at least you should, you should care about them only in the way you care about strangers. Um, but, uh, but that came from an idea I had when I was teaching. Just now, I think earlier you said that philosophy doesn't have much impact, and I guess that can be a bit depressing. Uh, so I was wondering, do you think that philosophers should do more? <laughs> like put themselves um, out there? I mean, one thing is I think that no matter what they do, it won't make much of a difference. So like to really have an impact, you need politicians to like listen to you, um, at least when it comes to like, you know, wanting to, to change the world in, um, in a positive way. Uh, I'm, I have sort of, <laughs> I, I'm pessimistic about, um, about that being successful. I don't think like politicians are motivated very well. And so um, I doubt that philosophers can do too much to move the needle on those things. Um, but uh, not everyone agrees with me. I think one of my colleagues, Neil Sinababu, who also, who, who cares more than I do about change, changing the world, uh, he sort of tries to communicate a lot with politicians in the U.S. He thinks that's um, that's that's some place where he can have have an impact on the world. And maybe he's right. Um, I'm not really I'm not really uh, qualified to judge, but I'm sure he he could tell you about some success, success story that he's had, where he convinced some somebody in a of something that maybe. Uh, change, change things, change things for the better. Um, I'm a little. I, I partly. I don't. I don't want to do do that sort of thing. I, you know, I don't want to work with people. I don't want to uh, have to have to convince politicians of anything. Um, and if you're not willing to do that, then there's not too much you can do to change change the world. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm a little bit pessimistic um, about that. But I guess your question was should should I should I change my mind? Should I be more um, 
more out there like like Neil. Um, maybe, maybe. There's a lot of things I should be doing that I'm not doing. Uh, that might be one of them. Where do you see yourself in five years? Or where do you hope to be in five years? Uh, well, hopefully I'll have tenure <laughs> in philosophy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said before, I'm not, I'm not like a forward thinking person. Like as, as far as my, I, I, I can't think more than like two months into the future at, at best. So uh, I don't know, hopefully I'll, I'll still be alive. Hopefully uh, there won't be a, you know, an awful pandemic out there. Um, hopefully I'll still be doing philosophy and still enjoying it. Um, and hopefully there'll be some, some good, uh, good TV shows out there that I'll, that I'll be watching. Um, and culture hasn't collapsed. That's that's all I hope for. Uh, yeah. Then do you have, I guess, strong political views of your own uh, that are separate from whether or not you're going to act on them? Good. So I guess y yes, in a way. So I mean, I, I think a lot about politics. I tend to have less strong views than most people in the sense that I, I think that the rational attitude to have is, is a lot of uncertainty. So I'm sort of Socratic in that way. You know, Socrates thought that, you know, he was the wisest because he knew that he knew nothing. And I also want to be wise like Socrates. <laughs> and so, uh, and so the, clearly what I should say is that I, I don't know much. Um, that's how you'd be wise. I, I kind of believe that. And so there are a lot of things that I'm not super confident about. Um, but I have, I, have a, I have strong opinions about what people shouldn't be confident about. So I guess in a way, that's a, that's a kind of opinion. Um, but yeah, I have political views. Uh, rough, roughly, I have, I mean, my views aren't super, super unusual, I think, in, um, at least among my peers. I have a like, pretty pretty ordinary, rel relatively ordinary. I, I would say like my views are similar to the views of like the, the median economist, I would say. Um, it's like rough, roughly captures my, um, my political views, but um, yeah, I, I prefer to answer more specific questions. <laughs> I think I, uh, I don't wanna put like a, a label on my views, which, um, which might mislead people. Um, and I think it's, it's good not to label yourself um, anyway, because once you once you attach a labor, label to your own views, you sort of become attached to some kind of ideology in a way that I think is um, intellectually dangerous for people. So, uh, yeah, better to have better just have specific opinions about specific topics and have varying degrees of confidence. What are your views on, I guess, the current debates on race and class in Singapore? So okay, so well, so what? What are the? You'll have to tell me. I've I've been away for for uh, okay. uh, for a year. Tell me about the current debates. Um. Uh, for the last few years, there has been a lot more discussion about class inequality. Uh, we have started debating about the enterprise of meritocracy. Um, I think I guess policy wise, we've moved the needle a little bit, and um, we are expanding notions of what merit is yeah and uh, regarding race uh, there's a bit more attention given to the disadvantage that minority races in singapore has yeah yes, good so yes yeah, so i would have to know a little bit more about like what particular views are are out out there um but i do think i do think that there is there's quite a bit of, there's race, so I think there's racism everywhere. And I think there's a lot of racism in Singapore. And I've heard people who are, you know, Malay, who are Indian talk about experiences they've had in Singapore that I think minorities in other countries will recognize. Um, and I think it's important for people to, you know, attend to those, um, those experiences. And I think it's, um, it would like, Singapore has sort of ideals of being like multicultural kind of, place and I think the more that I can live up to those ideals um, the better um, so I mean that's that's sort of vague but I think um, I think it's it's good that there's more attention to that sort of thing um, uh, regarding class 
and meritocracy, um, I think one thing that I've noticed is that <laughs> the, the people who are defending meritocracy and people who are attacking it often just don't, don't have anything like the same definition of meritocracy in mind. So I think people should be should do some philosophy and like think really hard about <laughs> what what what, is it, what does it mean for Singapore to be a meritocracy? Um, what is merit uh, uh, in in that context? And then I think there'll be a little bit less talking past each other between people. Because I think a lot, a lot of times people say people who are pro-meritocracy will be defending something, and then people who are anti-meritocracy will be attacking something quite different. And so their disagreement might be uh, not about meritocracy, um, but rather about whether whether this or that measurement really captures merits or not. Um, they might have all kinds of, um, of disagreements which are sort of getting lost um, because of confusions in the language that they're using to express that disagreement. So I think that's, that's a place philosophy might be able to help a little bit. Um, not that anybody will listen, but. What is, what's your general take on uh, vaccine hesitation? I'm sorry? Uh, your general take on vaccine hesitation. Oh, vaccine hesitation. Well, it's it's unfortunate. Um, the evidence is overwhelming that vaccines are extremely effective and not very dangerous, especially compared to um, getting the virus. I think um, it's a huge problem in the U.S. that sort of vac sort of being willing to take a vaccine has become a sort of like political signal for people. Um, that's, that's bad. I think thousands of people have died because of it. Um, probably hundreds of thousands, uh, over the world. And that's, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a tragedy. So yeah, people should take vaccines. There's no strong reason not to do it. Um, a lot of strong reasons to do it, both self-interested reasons and moral reasons because you protect other people. Um, so yeah, it sucks. <laughs> I don't know what to say. There's like no good. There's no good argument to be hesitant about vaccines, as far as I know. Do you think a topic like that, like defending the use of, uh, or defending the taking of vaccines, is uh, I guess even worth, uh, I guess serious philosophical defense, or is it the kind I, of thing very straightforward? I think it's the sort of thing that philosophers will almost all agree about. Um, and so there, there, there are quite a few issues, issues like that where they're like controversial in sort of the broader society perhaps, but among philosophers, there's almost no controversy. And so I think vaccines is one of those. I think there's probably almost nobody in philosophy who, who, will, um, who will argue that taking vaccines is, uh, is, is bad or, or, or something. Um, uh, part, I mean, that's not necessarily because philosophers are like super smart. It might just be a function of their, like uh, the fact that they're very liberal or whatever. Um, but it's just, that's just, I think a sociological fact about philosophy. And so I think, um, I also don't think there are very many interesting arguments against vaccination. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's, you know, there's, there's not like a, a great career to be made defending the use of vaccines within philosophy because everybody's already on that side. Um, Few other issues are like that as well. So is vaccine hesitancy just, uh, I guess, one of those depressing phenomena that uh, where rationality cannot speak to the anti-vaxxers? Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit pessimistic about how much rationality matters even for the even for people who are pro-vaccines. Um, so I just think like people aren't very rational. Um, it's just that the people who are pro-vaccines are like, luckily they have the right view <laughs> and the people who are anti-vaccines, unluckily they have the wrong view. Uh, maybe neither of them are super sensitive to the, um, to the arguments. Uh, like, I think, like people who are getting vaccines, maybe they, I, I'm sure a lot of them couldn't, couldn't like argue very strongly um, for why you should get them against somebody who had like a bunch of weird statistics on hand. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I guess I think of it as like, it's, it's some kind of, it's like a political problem of getting people to behave in a certain, in a, in a certain way, uh, people who aren't necessarily rational and not a philosophical problem of trying to come up with the best argument for something. 
Uh, you and I think that's part. That's partly why I sort of am, am a little bit pessimistic about philosophy making a big difference because like you can you can come up with all the best arguments, but you know, yeah, like nobody, you know, if in the U.S., if I went and I like you know piled up all the best arguments philosophers could come up with for why you should take a vaccine, and I went to you know some anti-vax you know. Uh, uh, you know, rally or something, I like <laughs> I would get no uptake. It doesn't it doesn't matter how strong the arguments are. Um, I would get booed out of there immediately. And so what you need is somebody who can who can somehow overcome that. Um, and there, but it's it's yeah, it's not a philosophical problem. It's it's more of a political sort of problem. Yeah, that kind of wraps up the the our interview, but a final request or question is whether you can do a Batman impression. <laughs> Maybe you could say something to whoever might be uh, might still be on this video. <laughs> uh, so you can, I, I think that in, in a way the Batman impression is really easy because you just have to you just have to growl as as much as you can. I think uh, I think there's a there's a Batman clip I I showed once I had to do the voices for. Uh, I think the line there was was uh, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. There, that's that, that's the best I can do at this at this short notice. Wow, it's really good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I so yeah. Uh, <laughs> let them know that I'm uh, I'm totally ready to be the next Batman as soon as they as soon as they're they're hiring someone. Will that be your parting message for uh, our viewers? <laughs> yep. And hi to all of uh, all of my present, past, and future students. Hopefully, things are going well for you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Prof. Abelard. Yep. Thank you.